Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Obi Abuchi. Obi Abuchi is passionate about helping leaders develop resilience and lead with purpose, courage, and authenticity. He's the founder and CEO of Core Leaders International and author of The Magic of Monday. He's also got two new books that will be coming out soon. He's a husband and proud father of three boys. He's a Christian and is devoted to making a positive impact in our world. He started his career as a trained systems engineer before navigating his way into the world of consulting and leadership development. Welcome to the podcast, Obi. Thanks for having me, Kimberly. It's uh, great to be on with you. Yes, and you live where? I live in uh, Surrey, uh, UK. Um, most people know Heathrow Airport, so I often say it's about 25 minutes southwest of Heathrow Airport. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And what I love about this podcast is I, I try to bring people from all over and, you know, I'm from the United States, so it's just wonderful to, to talk to someone from, from across the pond there. So <laughs> thank you for, very much for being here. I'm excited, really excited. Yeah, so just so people can get to know you and, and learn your story, because you started out doing one thing and now you're doing something else. Why don't you tell us about you? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm British born Nigerian. Uh, so I was born in the UK. And um, when I was seven, mom and sister and cousins, we moved back to Nigeria and I was there for 10 years and, and then came back to the UK, finished off um, college and then university and, and then eventually went into uh, the big wide world. Um, so that's, that's some of my background. Um, and in terms of how I got into doing what I'm doing now, that, that transition when I was seven is an important one because uh, not only um, not only did we go back to Nigeria by boat, um, I, I got to watch a a movie that stuck with me ever since I was seven, and um, the movie is called Return to Eden. Mm -hmm. And in it, I'll, I'll try and cut a long story short, but in it, there's this uh, wealthy a woman whose um, dad left her loads of money and, and she ends up marrying this washed out uh, tennis um, player who was only interested in her for her money. Um, and then shortly after they get married, he's out with her and, his, um, and her best friend and he throws her into this crocodile infested swamp. Now, I know you're probably thinking I shouldn't have been watching this at seven, but anyway, um, <laughs> Uh, and, and he, she's almost mauled to death by this uh, crocodile. And then uh, luckily some older guy comes and he shoots the, the crocodile and, and, and helps the lady sort of get back onto her feet. And he then gives her some money so she can make her way to uh, a local clinic. And she meets this doctor who performs plastic surgery on her and transforms her into, you know, this confident woman who ends up selling up, setting up a modeling agency and, and she gets revenge on her husband at the end. But what stuck with me as a seven-year-old, it was really interesting that I watched it and I saw what the doctor did to this lady and how she became confident afterwards. And she sort of found herself and, and yes, in a strange sort of way, as a seven-year-old, I looked at that and I thought, I want to do what that doctor did. I, I want to somehow be in a position where I'm bringing out the best in people and, and helping people to do more than they thought they could or they believed they could. And obviously, there were a lot of other things at play in the movie, but but that stuck with me. And so as a um, in the various things that I did um, after that, I always wanted it to be about bringing out the best in, in people. Mm -hmm. So a bit of my story. Yeah, I love that. And, and 
it's just astounding that you did pick that up at that age and it stuck with you that long. It, it is, it is. And I, I guess things just resonate. And um, you, you mentioned in, in my bio that I started off as a trained systems engineer. And some people might wonder, well, how did that happen then? Because, you know, that wasn't, or did you think, and that's not to say engineering doesn't help people. It absolutely does. Um, but but I, I honed in on wanting to be a doctor for a while. I thought that was it. And I, I had interviews at different universities, including Cambridge University. And all of the people that interviewed me, they said, oh, Obi's not interested in science, which was really shocking for me because I thought, what do you mean? I'm, I'm interested in, in, in helping people, but, but I realized afterwards they had picked up on something so true. I wasn't interested in science. I wasn't really interested in, in biology. And, and so I didn't get into any medical schools and, and I was devastated because as far as I was concerned, my world had come crushing down and, and I didn't know what I would do. And I remember once standing outside um, a Dean's office and, and I thought I'm gonna go in there and convince him that you've made a mistake and you need to let me in. And, but I said to myself, well, Obi, can you put your hand on your heart and say, you absolutely want to do this? And I couldn't. And so um, I ended up getting some advice from an uncle and he said, well, why don't you study engineering? You know, do a core professional course. So I, I went and studied engineering. But about a few weeks into my degree, I thought, I think I've made a mistake. I think I should be studying something like psychology. And But some friends said, hey, Obi, it's just nerves. So I ended up seeing it through and getting a master's. But while I was doing it, I came across a course called Organizational Behavior, which was all about how people were motivated. And so I knew I'd found that passion. And, and that was, it just reignited that desire again within me to um, just pursue that path. And so I got a graduate job as a train systems engineer because I studied engineering, but I very quickly, about 18 months into it, just moved out of that into project management and then into consulting and, and then leadership development. And, but, but that path was always, and that hunger to work with people was, was always there. So it just took a while to get there. <laughs> now, the things you just mentioned, project management and the systems you would learn and the logic you would learn in engineering is really, really helpful for leaders because leaders do have to be emotionally intelligent, but they also have to know how to put together systems and how to project manage uh, uh, things and a lot of times people to, to make it all come together. Absolutely. And, and so I, I look back on those skills that I learned, and I think it absolutely wasn't wasted. Um, the, the project management, having a, a vision of where you want to go and, and what it takes to get there and, and being, yes, being in tune with how I'm feeling, but also knowing when to um, stand firm, when to be clear about uh, the direction, what I stand for, what we stand for, being able to make a compelling case of what the vision is. So yes, yeah, so there's so much of the journey and the experience and the skills that I've picked up along the way that have been useful for me as a leader, as well as someone who works with other leaders as well. So um, how are you using that today? How are you working? Are you working with individuals? Are you working with companies? How is, how is, did, what does your business look like today? So it, it's a combination. So I do one-to-one -one coaching. So coaching uh, leaders, um, as well as working with organizations as part of big leadership groups, um, designing, delivering training programs, uh, hosting conferences. Uh, last week, I was speaking at a leadership uh, development um, conference for one of my clients. Uh, they were, it's the first time that they had been together since uh, the COVID lockdown. Uh, so it was quite exciting to be in front of people and not 
feel like I had to mute them. Uh, not that I wanted to. But <laughs> yeah, so that that was quite exciting. So so it's a combination of one to one, but also um, big events and, and working within organizations. Mm -hmm. And you also um, are an author and um, talk about your first book, The Magic of Monday. Why did you write it and what is it about? Sure. Yeah. Wow. Um, so my first book, The Magic of Monday, um, it was th the simplest way of describing it is most people say, thank God it's Friday. It's, it's the end of the week and I'm going to live for the weekend. And, and this goes back to, to my passion of wanting to bring out the best in people and help people live their best lives. I just felt that if you're really only living for two days of the week, then you are missing out on a significant chunk of, of life. And, and also, as a, I wrote it with young professionals and young people in mind at the time, and, and I was a, a young professional on a journey trying to find a fulfilling career. And uh, very often as a young professional, you've got this catch 22 where you think, hey, I've got a lot of zeal and, and, and energy and, and just give me the opportunity. And but organizations say, well, we can't give you the opportunity because you don't have the experience. And, and you're thinking, but, but if you just give me the experience then and, and give me this opportunity, then I'll get the experience. And it feels like a bit of a catch 22. And, and so I address that in the book and focus on um, what it takes to really experience that magic Monday through Friday. And I say in the book that that magic comes when there's this incredible unity of two things, a, a, a winning um, attitude, just deciding regardless of what's going on, I'm going to give my best. I'm, I may not have the experience that is needed, but I'm going to work hard. I'm going to graft. I'm going to do some of the hard things, the difficult things in order to um, get the opportunities that I want. And then the other thing I get people to focus on in the book is a winning focus, just really understanding what are your strengths and, and what are your talents? So many people are trying to be something else and they look at someone and think, oh, I wish I could be them. And, but yet you can't really be them. You want to be your best you. You want to be, I don't believe. And I used to hear people say, oh, you can be anything you want to be. I think there's some good in that, but I think it's actually really unhelpful. I think you can be anything that your strengths allow you to be. And so that's what I get people to focus on. Um, in the book. And so it, it didn't actually, I didn't actually start out wanting to write a book. I just, I spoke to 75 leaders, just asking them, what are some lessons that they have learned that could be passed on to the younger generation? And then it turned out that the insights were just so rich that I thought, I I've got to do this. I I've got to write a book. And and writing a book was on my bucket list. So it was also an opportunity to tick it off. But, but as I said, I didn't start off um, with the intention that time um, of writing um, my first book. Yeah. So that's a bit about it. And I was thinking about um, your history of, you know, you were in the UK and then you moved to Nigeria for a while and you were back again. What do you think that added to your life as far as, you know, what's the difference in the culture from Nigeria to the UK? And did you, do you feel like it like opened up your vision about things? Cause I know, you know, they talk about if someone who's grows up in a small town, stays in a small town, never leaves a small town and, and you were changing countries. So how do you think that enhanced your life and how you do life? Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing question, actually. Um, so my perspective on it has changed. If you had asked me as soon as I came back from Nigeria, I would have said, oh, I wish we hadn't gone. Um, it was because I, I just felt, I definitely felt more British than Nigerian um, going. And, and going as a seven-year-old, I missed some of the 
silly things, little things that a kid thinks of. I just thought, hey, I wanted to go to KFC and and I wanted to go to McDonald's easily and or Wimpy, whatever existed then, and 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 I couldn't. Um, and yet Nigeria offered so many more amazing things, but at the time I wouldn't say I appreciated it. And and when I came back, I I would describe it this way that in the UK, I felt at home, but in a true sense, I wasn't with my people. And then in Nigeria, I felt, hey, I'm with my people, but I didn't really feel at home because I just had a different perspective in certain ways. And, and it, it was, and we were there for 10 years straight and didn't come back. And so I remember re wrestling with my identity and thinking, but who am I? And, and what does it mean to be um, British born Nigerian? And, and am I Nigerian? Am I British? And, and, and what does it mean to be human? And, and someone said to me, well, Obi, how about thinking of it as you get the best of both worlds? And, and so that was a real shift for me. And I then realized that I could be part of a culture and and see it almost objectively. So I'm I'm in it, but I can I can embrace a different way of seeing and a different way of thinking. And so I find that it's made me so much more appreciative of humanity and and our differences and the beauty of our differences and recognizing that there's a uniqueness that a culture brings. There's a uniqueness of the, the British culture. There's a uniqueness of the Nigerian culture. And there's a uniqueness of the American culture and the Thai culture, Indian culture, wh whichever one. Um, and that uniqueness can be celebrated. Um, and and that's, a, that's a great thing. And so it, it's definitely made me more appreciative of cultures. I think far too many people, and, and this is something that leaders in particular need to pay attention to, is sometimes far too many people focus on the differences and, and think about, hey, what separates us and see that as a bad thing rather than see it as something to be celebrated and be curious enough about it and, and say, wow, this is different. Tell me more. I, I want to understand. And, um, and how can this enhance our experience of what it means to be alive and what it means to be human. So, um, so I'm grateful for it now. I, as I said, I, if you'd asked me as soon as I came back, I wouldn't have said I was, but now I think it's um, helped me have the ability to um, see cultures and people more objectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that too. And I think of different people and cultures kind of as flowers, you know, God created all these wonderful flowers, different colors, different shapes, tall ones, short ones, big oak trees. And they're all wonderful. And, and I love them all. And, and I was that kid in high school who always hung out with the international kids, you know, the, the, the ones coming just for, the, for the year, because it was sure. so interesting to me, just so interesting and learning these things and Vegemite sandwich. What's a Vegemite sandwich, you know, from <laughs> Australia? You know, I just, there's just so many cool things um, that you can learn or see that you never saw before. It's actually um, something where your curiosity can just go wild. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the thing. I, I think there's... Um, the we just we live in this amazing world that is so um diverse and 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 i really believe that that um god has created some incredible people incredible diversity incredible um i mean think of sometimes and this might sound a bit weird but sometimes i even think about just fruit that we eat and think we could have just had apples and pears and oranges and that would be it, three. But instead we have mangoes and, and there are strawberries and, and blueberries and, and raspberries and, 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 and some that I don't even know of. And, and, um, and, and I think it's just, this is incredible variety. And um, same thing in, in human beings and that variety 
um, ought to be celebrated. Um, and I think it's great when we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now they say that leaders are readers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing Indeed. that you're a reader. And if so, could you enlighten us with what you think some of the best books are, some of your favorite books are, it's like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go to the grave before you read this book. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. That's, uh, um, well, first of all, I think on, on just that topic of, yeah, leaders are readers. Absolutely. Um, and if I, before I talk about what some of the books are, I'll, I'll share about why I love reading so much and why I think it, it's amazing. And, and um, in a way, I mean, I'm grateful for my mum because growing up, she encouraged me to read and we'd read all sorts of books from uh, Famous Five and Secret Seven. And then as I got older, um, my mum was really into the John Grisham books and I got excited about those and uh, and I'd love it. We'd always say, hey, there's the new one out and you get it. And it was just great for e expanding your mind and vocabulary. Um, I think the shift for, came when I was about 18, though, in terms of the type of books I read. So a, a mentor of mine at church gave me a copy of uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So already, by the way, that's an absolute must. You, you, you before you go to your grave, <laughs> you need to read that book for, for several reasons. Um, it's, um, I think what a book like that did, and, and a lot of the books that I'm interested in now, are books that expand your thinking, um, help you to see more than you're capable of seeing um, we all have blind spots and we all have limitations to how much we can see, how much we can imagine, how much we can perceive. I, I sometimes say to people, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, um, a boring leader from a creative perspective in that I'm, I'm, I'm a visionary, but I'm, I'm not necessarily great at working out all of the detail, but I love reading because it just, it just expands what I'm able to see in my imagination. And Stephen Covey's book was a real shift for me because as an 18 year old, um, it got me thinking about the importance of taking personal responsibility for my life and growing and developing. And, and I've just never lost that hunger for uh, growth and development um, and, and insight. So for me, that's um, an absolute, um, a, as, a, as a Christian, the Bible um, is, a, is a critical one. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it, it absolutely is the, the best-selling um, book of all time. Um, and for me, again, it's some people think of it as just this book of do's and don'ts and but I think it gives us an incredible insight into into humanity but also into more than we're able to um, see and imagine and, and picture and I think it's an incredible love story of um, what I believe is God's heart for us as as humanity so so a, a bias there but that's one that I, I would encourage people to to read um, another one that's a really significant one is um, Man's Search for Meaning uh, by um, Viktor Frankl. Uh, and he, Viktor Frankl's um, psychiatrist that was caught up in the Holocaust, he was at um, uh, Auschwitz and one other uh, concentration camp and, and survived that. And, and it's his story of surviving it and just some insights into it that I think leader or not is just incredibly useful and there's this really powerful line in the book where he talks about um, everything can be taken from a human being except the last of the human freedoms the freedom to choose one's own attitude the freedom to choose one's own way in any situation um, and that's very aligned with some of the stuff that 
um, Stephen Covey talks about just this importance of personal responsibility. Am I taking responsibility for my life, for myself, or am I relying on on others and blaming others and you know blaming the president and blaming the prime minister and blaming the political parties and blaming others rather than taking responsibility for what I can uh, what I can do. Um, uh, so those are those are a few. I mean, there are so more that I could mention. I, I think Brené Brown's book, um, The Gifts of Imperfection, have been a significant one for me. Um, and I actually, I start my other book with a quote from Brené Brown, because I think it's so significant, just about that importance of authenticity as a leader. And in the third book that I'm contributing to, I also reference her there because that's been really powerful. And I think it speaks to men as well, who typically aren't that great at showing vulnerability and, and our humanity and, and just knowing that actually this is about being human. And if you want to engage people, especially as a leader, then you've got to be able to connect with your own humanity. And, and that means accepting your vulnerability. So I could go on, um, but I'll stop there for now. <laughs> See how much you love reading. So <laughs> awesome. And, you know, I remember growing up too, my mom reading to us, um, you know, C.S. Lewis and, and other, you know, authors where they've just really engaged you with sure. the stories. And, you know, our parents are always, the, 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 our teachers are our, our first teachers really and I find with our relationship mm. with our parents throughout life there are teachers at first and then are there are friends and then you know they're teaching us all along the way so talk to me about you know your mom who started reading with you and and you know mm. the, just the things that you're learning along the way being in relationship with her sure yeah um I mean, my relationship with my mom is a special one, partly because I didn't grow up with my dad. Um, so she was my mom, dad, and, and actually at an early age, before I really understood that typically there's, there's a, a dad and a mom, I just thought, oh, some people have moms and dads, and some people have a mum dad and and I had a, a mum dad and um and then shortly um actually shortly before we moved to Nigeria that was when I um my mum and dad their divorce came through and and so he was given visitation rights and that's when I remember seeing him but and then we moved to Nigeria and I didn't see him again and, and he passed away about six years after um, moving. So I really only saw him a handful of days in, in my life. But mom was, um, yeah, just a, a really great believer um, in me and my sister. I've got an older sister, Denise. Um, and mom was uh, a great, a rock to us. Um, incredibly kind and um, a generous um, I mean, I say was as if she's no longer here. But she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's seven years ago. And so, so in a way, it feels like she's not here because Alzheimer's is just an incredible destructive um, disease that just strips away someone's personality. So it's been given just how much of a rock she was to us and how much love she poured um into us and and supported us she encouraged my first book and probably bought more than anybody else <laughs> she would always tell people oh oh, my, oh you should read my son's book and she'd always say oh can I get some more and she'd always pay me for them and say you know here it is I'm buying it for this person and buying it for that person and so um yeah she was and and has been and, and it's been sad to um, feel that we can no longer engage with her in the same way. But um, my my second book, Leading from Your Core, I've dedicated to her because she she encouraged me to to write it. I, I sort of thought I was done with one, um, and but she'd say. 
the character in my first book is Josh. And she would say to me, Josh is patiently waiting and meaning that he's waiting for you to do the next thing. And so, so when I think of mom, um, I, I think of her as um, kind and generous, but someone who uh, believed in me and, and poured a lot of energy into encouraging um, me and, and my sister to do our best and, and so many other cousins that she's loved uh, along the way. So, um, but it, it's, yeah, it's quite a sad thing for me to, and my sister to be dealing with her decline through Alzheimer's um, at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and seven years is a long time. It is, yeah, it, it is, and um, yeah, and that's, that's a, as a disease, I think that's one of the things that makes it so hard, because you're effectively, you're grieving, and you just never know when it's going to, to end, and it's, it's always that there are just several step changes for the worse with um alzheimer's and and one minute my my wife and i um we were talking about it a couple of months ago that there was a time when mum would um she would stay with us and she would repeat stories and we found it i mean i in particular found it irritating and i'd be annoyed and oh, she's going on and on and on Little did I know that that time would come when she wouldn't share any stories anymore. And, and I think, and I was saying to my wife, wow, I would take that, those moments back in a heartbeat where she was repeating the stories because at least she was engaging then, at least she was trying to connect. And, uh, and that's, that's part of the, the sadness of, of Alzheimer's is that we're constantly throughout the seven year period and it continues, we're constantly dealing with loss mm -hmm. and yet the person is still, is still there. Um, that's, yeah, that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. mm. So you, you, you're in that right now, you're dealing with that, that's your life right now. Mm. So when you are working with people when you're doing your work day to day mm. how do you keep yourself not necessarily separate but you can't stay in that lost state all the yeah. time because you wouldn't be able to do your work so how mm. do you actually handle that do you compartmentalize in your mind or how do you bring yourself out so you can actually be your best self even with something going on in your life that's very difficult mm -hmm. yeah if you'd asked me that question i don't know five years ago i i would have struggled probably to answer that um there was a, a day when my mum. this was probably about three years ago now she went missing and it was a day that I was about to launch my new website for my business. And I remember she, she went missing. We didn't know where she was. And I, and I was walking. I was praying. I was in tears. I said, God, please help us to, to find her. I, I just can't. You hear stories of people that go missing and you just never know where they are and I just thought I could not deal with the turmoil of of that and and thankfully she ended up showing up um the next day we still don't know where she was all night but we're we're thankful that um she did um but it, it's um you know I talk about talked a little bit about my my faith I think that's been um a big part of helping me stay grounded. Um, I think if you are going through difficult things, but you don't have a way of seeing the world that recognizes that, 
Yes, there's beauty. I mean, we talked earlier on about the beauty that the world has to offer and the diversity and just, you know, and just fruits and the trees. And there are some beautiful places in this world. There's also um, rubbish and darkness and, 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 you know, beautiful things. There's, there's rubbish, there's, you know, um, darkness and, and disease. And, and yet, I, I think at the same time, there is a you know, I think my faith and being able to um, pray for me is important in those difficult moments and just trust that, that whether we connect with it or, or not, and for some people, you know, it, it, it's the universe, it's spirituality, there's, you know, but I just believe that, that we do have a kind um, uh, creator, father, um, who um, it has our back and is interested in in us and interested in our lives and and yes we go through painful moments but for me that's a real anchor that is that's an absolute anchor and um I, I don't care who you are as as a leader if you don't have a strong anchor then when life throws all of the curveballs your way and it will one one way or the other it will you will be shown for whether you have a strong anchor or not. And so for me, my faith is, is a big part of that. Um, friends, I mean, I have um, cried more and talked more with friends about this, just having an outlet, um, having a, an opportunity to just say, um, I'm feeling gutted about this. I'm feeling broken about this. I'm feeling devastated. I feel... Um, some moments I just can't handle uh, the, the loss. Um, and that's been important. My wife has been a huge uh, support as well, just being able to speak to her about it and, and talk and, and listen and, and pray. And um, that's been uh, really important. And amazingly, I think it's brought something deeper to the work that I do. So I don't feel that I that I need to compartmentalize. And now, of course, I'm not going to. If I'm about to speak in a, at an event, um, I I can't, you know, get up and start crying. I mean, I could, but you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to make it about me. Um, and in fact, I actually remember, I remember one other situation where I had gone up, I was about to run an event for um, a leadership uh, team. Um, and I gone to the hotel the night before my sister was away, mum was in, in London. And I get a call at about 10 o'clock at night. So I'm getting ready for bed, get a call at 10 o'clock at night. And they say, we can't find your mum, your mum's missing. And I'm two hours away by train. There's no train heading back at, at that point. And, and I'm just thinking, wow, so what do I do? What, what do I do in this moment? And so I had to make some calls. And luckily, there was a, a really a good Samaritan that helped put mom into an Uber. I then tracked it and, and mom got back to her temporary accommodation or her accommodation where she was staying at the time. Um, and then I could eventually go to sleep. And then I woke up the next day and I'm there with this team and, and looking at everybody and thinking, wow, so, and now I've got to, I've got to step up, right? And I've got to connect and I've got to engage and I'm, I'm here to help them as a team and I want to make it about them, but I'm hurting. I'm reeling from what happened the, the night before and just the reality of how do we make sure mom's safe? And so um, the, the leader that was organizing it all had a conversation with her and, and, and she said, so, you know, how are you doing? And I just thought I'll use that moment just to be honest and just say, well, it was a bit of a tough, tough evening because my mom went missing, but she's OK. So and that was an opportunity, at least with her to be able to say, you know, it's been tough, but I'm still here to give and still here to serve and work with the team and it's going to be a great time um and i've learned to do more of that that brings my 
my humanity, my weakness and say, actually, that's okay. And I'm finding that it's helping me to connect with others and, and other leaders and other people that I work with at a much deeper level. And the last year, so last 18 months of COVID have been incredible. I think more than any other time in, in certainly my history anyway, that I think more leaders have just recognized that how much of life is challenging because they're having to lead their people um, they're having to support them. They're also having to deal with, or they've had to deal with homeschooling themselves or a loved one that's been sick or parent or, or something. And, and just a real recognition that yes, we're, we're people doing creative things and incredible things in the, in the workplace, but we're also human beings that hurt, um, that have pain, that have trauma. Um, and so so I've answered sort of, in a sense, a combination of things that help me stay grounded, but also I think it's been helpful in my work just to connect at a much deeper level with uh, the people that I work with. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned during the story, your wife and, and you have three boys and how three has boys. that been, you know, you were, you were raised basically by a single parent pretty much mm -hmm. and, and now you're in this wonderful triangle of you your wife your sons how has that been for you and how has um just being in relationship with your wife and your business just putting that all together how has that been for you uh, compared to like how you you grew up yeah um so i i think Possibly the fact that I'm a reader helps in the sense that I knew there was a gap. So mom, my mom was amazing, but there was still a gap um, in just having a father figure in my life. And, and so that's that's one of the other reasons that re reading was exciting for me, because just, I just had lots of questions. And I thought, oh, but what about that? Oh, let's read about it. Oh, what about that? Let's read about it. Oh, what about that? So, you know, I do that and, and just really curious about, about things and about um, being a father and being um, a, a, a dad. Having said that, when when our first, when we were expecting our first child and we didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl, I was so nervous. I, I wanted it to be a girl because I thought, now girls I can handle. I had a sister, had a mom, da 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 da, da. Um, But, I, and I thought, hey, you know, we have our girl. I just call her, hey, she's my little princess. And hey, presto, everything's good. But with a boy, I just, because I didn't grow up with my dad, I, I just, I was nervous about a disconnect. I thought, but what if we're not close? And what if there's no connection? And, and what if I can't be a great dad? I just don't know how to relate to him because I never did anything with my dad. And so I'm not going to know what to do with him. And a, gr a friend of mine um, said to me, uh, Obi, you do realize that it's going to take your child 18 years to become 18. <laughs> and it's so simple, right? But, but it was so helpful for me because I, what that said to me is, Obi, you're going to have time to do this. You're going to be with them one and then two. And, and by the time you get to 18, unlike your relationship with your dad, there'll be 18 years worth of history and, and connection. So, so don't, you know, get too wigged out about it. And, um, um, and so I think that 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 helped. And my wife, Beju, we we met uh, at um, church, and we both got a similar faith. And she came from just you know her mom and dad being uh, together and still together, and and it's, and have a great relationship. And so so when we got um, married, she came into it with a desire to hey, I want something like what my parents had. And I came into it with a, well, I want something that I never had. And so it was a, a beautiful synergy. And not to say that it's been perfect. I mean, we've absolutely had ups and downs, but, um, but we've got an incredible partnership. And I'm grateful 
incredibly grateful for that. And, and I think that helps us have a great foundation with uh, our boys and our boys are now 14, 12 and 10. Um, so we've got, um, yeah, three. Uh, sometimes people ask, uh, at one point people would ask if you wanted a girl and I just say, hey, the car is full. Um, <laughs> that's it. And and they might say, well, get a seven seater. I'm like, no, we need that for the luggage. Um, so, um, or as the boys get bigger, you know, we'll just need more, more space. But, um, but I, I enjoy the, yeah, the connection that I, I have. And, and I'm very conscious with my boys of things that I never got to do with my dad that I want to do with them. Um, and I didn't always get it right. For example, just um, DIY, I was just used to, I'd do it myself, I'd do it myself. But my boys, they would take the initiative and say, oh, hey, can we help you with this? And can we help you with that? And in fact, there was one moment when my older boy, I think he was about 10 at the time, and I was mowing the lawn. And, and I was out doing some work in the garden, and I actually found it quite tough. And and he comes and says, hey, dad, can I help? And, and he wants to mow it. And I ended up going away. And I just had a, I was in tears for a bit because I was just so moved that, oh, wow, he wants to, he wants to be with me and do stuff with me. And, and I, I was conscious of the fact that I never got to do this with my dad. And it felt so special. Um, so, yeah, I'm grateful for the relationship that we're getting to my wife and I getting to build with with our boys and and I love yeah the the relationship that I have with them yeah that sounds wonderful so um I have a question it's kind of like a double question so as a a business person and a woman I have found that um women in general have begun quite powerful we're you know we're leaders we're running businesses, we're totally self-sufficient. Mm. And then, you know, I'm actually um, single right now. And so I'm looking for a man who is strong and whatever, but so many times because we're so powerful, we intimidate these gentlemen leaders, but we really, oh. what we, we don't, we want to be in control at work. We're the boss at work, but when we're at home, we don't want to be the boss. So yeah. how can um, men leaders um, step up for their women? Because I think that's what we want. We want our equal. We want those men leaders to step up and be the leader of the family. Mm -hmm. But like I said, so many of them, they just look at us and go, well, what does she need me for? Because, you know, men have to be needed. They have to feel like they're providing or they're, you know, so talk about that. How, how do men step up and be that strong man that the strong women want? Yeah, wow. Um, I have, th that's been a topic that I've explored and been interested in and, and dabbled in over the years. I don't remember the specific book now, but there was a story I came across years ago that sort of spoke to this. And it was um, this uh, lady, she was a CEO of an international company and, and was traveling all around the world. And, and her husband, he had a job, I think it was local, um, but his job wasn't as high flying as hers. And, and there was this interaction where he said something like, oh, I feel like um, you don't need me or something like that. And what he meant was you don't necessarily need me to provide for you because you've got this job and you don't need it. And she said, you're right. I, I don't need you, but, but I want you. Um, and, and I remember listening or reading that at the time and just thinking, oh, I, I loved that of, um, it wasn't this whole, I've got to, as a guy, I've got to show that I'm better than you. And, and I'm the one that brings home uh, the bacon with my wife, Biju. One of the things that I've always wanted is, is the partnership. 
I, I'm a firm believer, regardless of, so even if um, as a woman, you feel, hey, I'm, I'm powerful, I'm self-sufficient, the reality is we all need people, we could all do with the benefit of a great partnership, there's none of us that can be an island. And so what I see, and I speak to a lot of men about this, just the importance of understanding what leadership means. For some men, they think leadership means I've got to earn more than her and, and I've got to be smarter than her and I've got to, well, no, you just need to be able to be a great partner to her mm -hmm. and recognize that, that sometimes that leadership isn't necessarily about, oh, I've got to have it all mapped out and I've got to have the perfect answer to everything and, and my answers have to be better than her. No, I just need to be able to take the initiative and just say, hey, I've just been thinking about how we could um, grow as a couple. I've been thinking, oh, I've noticed that, that um, this has been on your mind lately, or you're interested in this, you know, how can I help? How can I serve you? I think when, when men, women, anyone, but obviously in this particular situation, we're talking about men, when they realize that leadership is ultimately about serving, um, I've got one of the questions, so I often talk about three of the most powerful questions leaders could ask. One of them is, what can I do that will bring about the most good? And so if I'm, there's, um, I'm in a partnership with, with someone, I'm interested in that, what can I do that will bring about the most good for them? And when I'm thinking about those sorts of questions, then I'll realize that there's no point in being threatened or, or intimidated because it's not a competition. Um, and sadly, us men, sometimes we're all about that. We're all about the competition. So we're trying to, you know, who earns more? It's like, no, it isn't. Forget it. It's not a competition. It's an opportunity to, to partner. It's an opportunity to do the most good. And what is it that she can add to my life? What is it that I can add to her life? How can we together do something incredible. There are some things and perspectives that my wife brings to me that I think absolutely, I just, there's no way I'd think about that. There's just no way. Um, and I know the same thing, vice versa. So I just think if people see it as a partnership, that is one plus one isn't two, one plus one is three, together we can do so much more than either one of us could alone then I think all of that intimidation will be out of the picture. And actually, you'll feel, I'm excited that I get a step up. I'm excited. If being with this woman means I get to step up, then I'm excited because we get to do more good for the world than either one of us could do alone. So a bit of a long answer, but hopefully. Yeah, but, that, but that's helpful. So thank you. So I want to talk about the book that's coming out any day now. <laughs> sure, yes. Um, so I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, even though this one is coming out after my first book, um, The Magic of Monday. So this new one is leading from your core. In a way, I feel like I've been writing it for probably about 20 years because um, there's a lot of, um sweat and heart and reflection from from a good two decades that has gone um into it and um the the premise and hopefully some of that comes from the title but uh, the the subtitle is the path to becoming a, a more purposeful courageous resilient leader and i see and have seen and, and work with a lot of leaders with with great hearts but, but not a lot of depth and, and far too many. And I had a really interesting experience early on in my career where I worked with a lot of leaders who led more by virtue of their position and their authority and their superiority and their intelligence rather than from a place of purpose and, and their character and knowing who they are and, and what they stand for and the impact that they want to have in the world and the difference that they want to make. And, um, and so in the book, I lay out a model um, for just really developing that inner strength, 
that character, that mindset. And I also interviewed 60 leaders from all around the world, just asking them questions about resilience, about personal mastery, about courage, and, and put some of their stories into the book. So it's out on uh, the 30th of September, 2021. That's when it's released, um, having a book virtual book launch in October. Um, but I, I'm really excited about it because I think that it's incredibly relevant for where we are now. Um, I, I think there is a, a, a depth that is needed in leadership globally. And I don't say that arrogantly. I just say that soberly, uh, that there is a, a depth that is needed uh, in leadership. And, and I'm really hopeful that my book will add to that. Uh, conversation and, and the opportunity for leaders to uh, dig so much deeper and become more resilient um, and impactful in the way that they lead. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that is so true. I, I totally believe that too. And is that really just sounds like a legacy piece. This book is, I mean, if you've been working at it for 20 years, that's a legacy piece. Yeah, it, 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 in the sense that, so I, I started working on it three years ago, but in it pulls on stories from 20 years ago um, that just, yes, that, that are really, in a way, some of my best insights, my most potent insights, I like to say, about leadership. And because I've been a student of leadership, both in, in an academic sense, reading it, but also in a practical sense, just as a leader and as I've grown as a leader, just re realizing what works and what doesn't, what, what engages minds and what doesn't, what inspires people and what doesn't, what helps you to be more transformational and what and what doesn't. And so a lot of that has gone in, into the book. And, and yes, I think if, if um, there was a book I would want my boys to read and say, you know, here, here boys, this is part of dad offering you some of his best advice to as to how to make a difference in this world, then then this would be this would be it. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would like to know how to get in contact with you, where to find your book. Can you kind of go over those things where they can find you and work with you? Sure. Yeah, I am. I'm on LinkedIn. So if they search me on LinkedIn, um, Obi Abuchi, as far as I know, I don't know that there are many other Obi Abuchis there, so it should be pretty easy. Um, or my website, um, Core Leaders, so www.coreleaders.co.uk. Um, and there's also my personal website, um, www.obiabuchi.com. Uh, um, so those are some of the ways that people can get hold of me. And then my book from the 30th of September, will be available on Amazon. Um, anyone with a Kindle can pre-order it now and then paperback will be out from then on. And also an audio version will be coming out a few months later. So um, yeah, different channels. Great, wonderful. So just a personal question, what gives you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life right now? Well, right now, family for sure, um, with, without a doubt. And I think that was reinforced um, over the last 18 months, um, especially just with, um, with the lockdown. It was different people experienced it in different ways around the world, but for us, it meant being at home quite a bit. And to be able to do that with, with uh, Biju and the boys and, and have some incredible memories that we probably wouldn't have. And so, and even though everyone's now back at school, it, it's still um, a special part of um, what's given me joy right now. So, Beautiful. yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for all your wisdom and sharing and stories and just being really transparent and authentic. Thank you, Kimberly. I, I enjoyed it. Really enjoyed the conversation. So thanks for having me on. Yeah. So I have one last question before we complete. Okay. What is your best advice for living an incredible, amazing life? Oh, so that's that's an easy one. Um, it's been 
again, I got to go back to books, but there's one of my favorite books um, is Wild at Heart. And, and there's a quote in that book that kind of inspired me to move into consulting at the time that I did. And it's, um, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go and do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Uh, and so that's part of my advice to, to people. It's don't so much focus on need. What makes you come alive? What fires you up? What excites you? What do you want to be known for and stand for in the world? And what difference do you want to make? And go and do that. Um, and uh, that's absolutely what the world needs. So yeah, hope they like that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Obi. Thank you, Kimberly. Yep, and we'll talk to you again soon. Talk to you soon.